So last time around, we did a simple tutorial on how to think recursively. And this was all done on the iPad, and what I gave you is a simple seven-step process for thinking about how you can write recursive programs in a language such as Haskell. And at the end, we saw sometimes how you can think about generalizing or uh, simplifying some of the definitions which you come up with. So what we're going to do today is move things on. We're going to be looking at chapter 8, which is on declaring types and classes. And the background to this is that so far in the course, we've only been using built-in types. So today, we're going to see how you can declare your own types as well. So I'm going to introduce you first to one of the two new ways for declaring a new type in Haskell. There's the type declaration mechanism and there's the data declaration mechanism. So in Haskell, a new name for an existing type can be defined using the type declaration mechanism. And it's actually an important piece of terminology here in Haskell. You define functions, but you declare types. And I'll try and be consistent today when I'm talking about types. I'll, I'll try and always say we're declaring a new type, but maybe from time to time a definition will slip in and I'll accidentally say we're defining a type. But if we want to be precise, you define functions, but you declare types. So what we have in the blue box here is a simple type declaration from the Haskell standard library. And this is precisely how the string data type is declared. So the declaration simply says we're declaring a new type called string and it's simply an abbreviation or a synonym for a list of characters. So um, this is um, how strings are treated in Haskell. They're just lists of characters. This is the, the declaration in the standard library which makes that the case. So string is just a synonym for a list of characters. So what's the point of having these kind of type, de type declarations? Well, one of the points is that they can make other types easier to read. So here's a simple example of this. Um, here I've declared a simple type called POS for positions, and it's just going to represent kind of X, Y coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. So we might have a pair of an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, both of which are integers. So once I've declared a type like that, what I can use is, uh, what I can do rather, is use it to make some other types a bit easier to read. So I've given two simple definitions in the blue box at the bottom. I've defined the origin, which is just 0, 0, and that is a position. So origin has type pos. So that's much nicer, I think, than writing the origin as a pair of integers, because if you have just a pair of integers, it could be any old random pair of integers, but we want them to be interpreted as positions here. So we're using the type declaration pos to make that explicit. Then in the second example down the bottom, we're defining a little transformation called left, which is a function that takes a position to a position, and left of x, y, we simply decrement the x coordinate to move one space to the left. And again, I think the type here for left, position to position, is much nicer than writing that it takes a pair of integers to a pair of integers, because now I can see, uh, just by looking at it, that it's some kind of transformation on positions. So Haskell tries to be very flexible. So just like function definitions can have parameters, so type declaration can also have parameters as well. So here's a simple example of this. So here I've declared a type called pair, and it takes a single type A as its parameter, and a pair of A's is going to be exactly what you expect. It's just a pair of A's, so A comma A in round brackets. So this time around, the type declaration is actually not any shorter. I mean, writing P A I R space A is longer than actually writing the pair A comma A. But again, this could maybe make uh, some other types that I write later on easier for me to understand, even though in principle, writing P A I R of A is a bit more of a boast. So here's a couple of examples of this. Here I'm defining down the bottom a multiply function, and multiply takes a pair of integers and gives me a single integer, and I simply take the pair m, n and multiply them. And here I've got a little function called copy, and copy simply takes a value of type a, it's a polymorphic function, and it transforms it into a pair of values of type a. And copy of x is simply the pair x, x. 
So it's a bit of a contrived example here. I'm not really getting much um, leverage or mileage out of having this type, but it illustrates the idea that type declarations can also have parameters. So the last thing to note about type declarations is that they can be nested, but they cannot be recursive. So there's some examples on the slide to illustrate this. So in the top blue box, I've got the position data type. So position is simply a pair of integers, and then I'm using it in a transformation type. So I've declared a type called trans here, and trans is just going to be a function that takes a position as an input and gives a position as an output. So here I'm using some kind of nesting because I'm using the position type to declare the, the trans type, and that's perfectly fine. And then, for example, if I went back to my little example at the bottom here, I could say that the left function is now a transformation. Okay, it's a function from positions to positions, and that might be beneficial to me if I was defining right, up, and down as well. I could say they also have type trans. So using one type within another is perfectly fine, but um, for technical reasons, they cannot be recursive. So at the bottom of the slide here, we have a declaration for a tree data type, which in principle makes perfect sense. So we're declaring a type called tree here, and it's a pair comprising an integer. So we can think of that as being a value that's living at the root of the tree. And then we have a list of subtrees. And that list of subtrees could be empty, so this doesn't recurse forever. So in principle, this is a perfectly valid definition for a tree data type where you have multi-way branching. So you could have zero, one, two, or as many as you like branches at each level. But for technical reasons to do with the type system, you cannot have this recursive type. So type declarations can be nested like we see at the top, but they cannot be recursive. So they cannot be defined in terms of themselves. And we'll see later on how you can actually declare recursive data types like tree using the data declaration mechanism. So this brings us on now to the second of the two ways to declare new types in Haskell, which is the data declaration mechanism. So the idea is that a completely new type can be defined by specifying its values using a data declaration. So what we've got here in the blue box is an example of this from the Haskell standard library. And notice here we're using the data keyword rather than the type keyword. Type introduces a new name for something which already exists. The data keyword introduces a completely new type. And you simply explain what the values of the type are. So in this case, it's the type of Boolean values. And there's two values in the type. There's false or there is true. So the way you read this is that we're declaring a new type called bool, and there's two new values in this type which are called false and true. So there's a few things to note about these kind of data declarations. So the first one is a piece of terminology. So the two values, false and true, these are called constructors for the type because they give you a way of constructing values in the type. The second point here is one we've partially already seen. So we've already seen that type names must always begin with an uppercase letter. So when we write the integer type and the float type, we write int with a capital I and float with a capital F. And it's the same with constructor names. So when we have constructor names like false and true, and actually the name of the type bool as well, they must always begin with an uppercase letter. And this is because Haskell is trying to keep a clear distinction between the world of kind of functions and their parameters, which start with lowercase letters, and types and constructor names, which always must start with an uppercase letter. So the last comment on the slide here is a little technical point. So it's saying that data type declarations are similar to context-free grammars. So some of you uh, watching this video may already have uh, studied parsing and grammars and things like that in computing, and you know a bit about context-free grammars. If you're taking this course in Nottingham, I don't think you've probably seen context-free grammars yet, but when you come to see them, what you'll find is that there's a connection with the data type declaration mechanism. And the connection is that the data type declaration mechanism specifies the values of a type, whereas the context-free grammar mechanism specifies the sentences of a language. And what you see is that the, the syntax that's used for that in context-free grammars is basically the same as the data type declaration syntax. And actually, this is where the syntax for this in Haskell comes from. 
So again, if you've seen context-free grammars before, this may be a useful observation for you. If you haven't seen them yet, when you come to study them in computing, you can see or you'll observe that the data type declaration mechanism in Haskell is basically doing exactly the same kind of thing. So let's move on a little bit now. So values of new types can be used in the same way as values of built-in types. So Haskell tries to be very flexible in this regard and basically you can do whatever you like with uh, your own types that you can with built-in types. So here's a simple example which illustrates quite a few points but it's a nice little example. So what I have here is an answer data type and I've declared that an answer can be either yes, no or unknown. And an important point to note here actually is when we declare data types like these, the, these words mean something to us when we know what an answer is in English and we know what yes, no and unknown means, but to the system these words have no intrinsic meaning and it's just the same when we defined or declared the boolean type. Bool means something to us and false and true means something to us, but it doesn't actually mean anything at all to the system. So as far as the system's concerned, we could have written at the top of the slide here, we could have written data answer equals B or, or we could have written rather data A equals B or C or D. So answer, yes, no, and unknown. These words have meaning to us, but they don't actually have any meaning to the system. We give them meaning by the functions that we define. So here I've defined a couple of bits and pieces down the bottom, which illustrate some other points. So down at the bottom, I have declared that the answers is simply going to be a list of answers, and answers is yes, no, or unknown. So the point I'm actually making here is that you can put values of your own data types into a data structure. Okay, so in this case, I'm putting the three values, yes, no, and unknown into a list. So it's showing it's flexible. You can do stuff with your own data values that you can do with anything else. And then the little flip function down the bottom, this is illustrating three things. You can take answers as an input, you can give answers as an output, and you can also do pattern matching on answers. So again, the Haskell system is flexible. You can do with your own data types more or less anything that you can do with the built-in data types as well. So in this case, we're matching on the answer. It could either be yes, in which case we return no. It could be no, in which case we return yes. Or we could flip unknown, and in that case, we just give back unknown. So the point here is that you can put your own values into data structures, like we did with the answers definition. You can pattern match on values of your own data types, and you can pass them as parameters and return them as results. So Haskell is trying to be very flexible. In terms of flexibility, another aspect of this is that the constructors in a data type declaration can also have parameters. And this is a really simple and very, very useful idea. So here's an example of this. So I'm declaring a shape data type and I've said there's two things that a shape could be. So I've got a circle constructor which takes a float as its parameter and that's simply going to be the radius of the circle. And then I have a rectangle constructor and that takes two floats as parameters and that's simply going to be the two sides of the rectangle. Okay, so we're declaring a new type called shape the two constructors, one called circle and one called rectangle, and the first one takes a single float and the second one takes two floats. And then of course we could use these data type or use this data type to declare or define some useful functions. So at the top of the bottom blue box I'm defining a function called square and square takes a float as an input, that's going to be the length of the side of a square and it's going to build a shape and uh, the definition is the obvious one, a square of size n is simply a rectangle of size n by n. And then down the bottom we're computing the area of a shape, so the area of a circle of radius r is just pi r squared, that's just your high school mass, and the area of a rectangle of size x and y is going to be x times y. So again here we're passing in a shape as an input parameter and we're pattern matching on it to deconstruct what the shape could be and that gives us a very clean and simple way of defining the area function. Okay, So you can have uh, parameters to your constructors and that lets you define things in simple ways like you have on the slide here. So a few little points to note. 
So the first one, we've kind of already said it. Um, so shape has values of the form circle R, where R is a float, and rectangle of X and Y, where X and Y are floats. An interesting observation is the second point on the slide here. And what's basically the case is that the circle constructor and the rectangle constructor are actually functions. And this is actually how these are viewed internally to the Haskell system. They're constructor functions that build values of type shape. So if you type this declaration for shape into the Haskell system and you say, what is the type of circle and what is the type of rectangle, then you get these type here. They're constructor functions. So circle takes a float as its input, that's the radius of the circle, and it builds you a shape, whereas the rectangle constructor takes two floats, one at a time, as a curried function, and it builds you a shape. So the idea here is that these constructor values, they build values of the shape type, and these values are just data. So I want to give you kind of three verbal examples here, just to emphasize the point. So suppose you start up GHCI, and you type in 1 plus 2. So you get the little greater than prompt that means GHCI is waiting for it to do something. Type in 1 plus 2. 1 plus 2 is a computation, and that will be evaluated by the system, and you'll get back the result, 3. Whereas, if you start up GHCI, and you type in the list 1, 2, 3, in square brackets, 1, 2, 3 is a piece of data, it's not a computation. So if you ask GHCI to evaluate the list 1, 2, 3, it's already in its most primitive form, it will just give you back 1, 2, 3. It's a value, not a computation. And these constructor functions, circle and rectangle, they build values. And these values don't have computational content. So for example, if you asked GHCI to evaluate circle of 1.0, that's already in primitive form, it's just a value, it's a piece of data, and it will give you back circle of 1.0. And the way you actually deal with these things is you need to write functions, like the area function, that can decompose a shape and actually process that data, and in the end you get out something like a float. Okay, so the last thing we need to know about data type declarations is that these can also have parameters. Again, Haskell tries to be very flexible. So what we have on the slide here is the maybe type, which is built in to the Haskell system. So if you look in the standard library, which I've made available to you on the web page for the module, then this is the declaration for the maybe type. So what it's saying is we're declaring a new type called maybe. It has a type parameter a, which could be anything you like, like int or bool or whatever. And then there's two constructors for the type. We have nothing and that one doesn't take a parameter, and then we have just, which takes a single parameter of type A. So a simple example of this is if you had a value of type maybe of int, it could either be nothing, or it could be just of an integer. So something like just of one or just of two. And the way we think about the maybe type in Haskell is it's used to represent things that could fail or crash, if you like. Um, and nothing represents something which has failed, and just represents something which has succeeded, and then the parameter is the successful value. So what I've done down the bottom of the slide here is I've used the maybe type to define two safe versions of library functions, the integer division function and the list function head. So why do we need safe versions of these? Well, both of these functions could crash. So you could have a division by zero, or you could attempt to take the head of an empty list. So what we've done on the slide here is we've defined safe versions of each of these two functions using the maybe data type. So safe div takes two integers, one at a time, as a curried function, and then it maybe gives you back an integer. And the first case for the definition for safe div says if you pass me any old first parameter, I don't care what it is, so it's the wildcard pattern, and then you have a zero as the second parameter, so this would be attempting to divide by zero. Rather than crashing out, I return the value nothing to indicate that this function has failed. The second case for safe div says if you give me any other two numbers m and n, I know that the n is not zero now because that would be uh, caught by the first case, I can perform the division, m divided by n, and then I tag it as a successful value using the just constructor. 
Okay, so this is just like division, except we've got this kind of wrapper code, which avoids crashing out in the case of division by zero by using the two constructors, nothing and just of the maybe type. And then finally, safe head, that basically performs as the head function. Remember head gives you the first thing in a list, but that would crash if it's given the empty list. So here in the definition, we're matching, if, the if we get the empty list as an input, we give back nothing rather than crashing out. If we get a non-empty list, in this case x's, then we simply call the head function. That will give us the first thing, and that's guaranteed to succeed, and we tag it up as adjust. Okay, so this is more or less how you program with things that could fail in a language like Haskell. I mean, Haskell does actually have a kind of standard and quite sophisticated exception handling mechanism, but typically we don't tend to use that too much. We just have functions that return maybe values. So what we're going to look at now is the idea of recursive types. And the idea is a simple one. New types can be declared in terms of themselves. So in other words, types can be recursive. So what I've given you in the blue box here is the kind of simplest example that I could think of of a useful recursive data type. So let's understand the components. So we're declaring a new data type called NAT. And it's got two constructors, zero, which doesn't have any parameters, and successor, which takes a NAT as a parameter. So we can see in the blue box that it's a recursive declaration because I'm declaring the new type NAT in terms of itself via the NAT parameter of the successor constructor. So what we have in the callout box down the bottom, NAT is a new type and it's got two constructors, zero, which is a NAT, and successor, which is a function that takes an existing NAT and builds you a new one. So what's actually going on with this data type? Well, let's think what the values of the type NAT could be. So a value of this type is either zero or it's of the, of the form successor of n, where n is an existing NAT. So what this gives you is a little kind of procedure for building an infinite sequence of values of type NAT. So what's the basic value? So you have zero, that is a value of type NAT. How can you build another one? Well, if you have any value of type NAT, such as zero, you can apply the successor constructor to it, and that will build you another value. So successor of zero is also of type NAT. And then you can use that one as a parameter to the successor constructor and get another one and so on and so on. So what you see is that the recursive data type declaration, which we have here, is giving us a little process or a little procedure for building an infinite sequence of values where we start off with zero and then we can have as many successor constructors on the front as we like. So of course, and I've been trying not to say it, but it's very obvious, we can think of values of type NAT as representing natural numbers. So natural numbers are just non-negative integers. So zero, Z-E-R-O, is going to represent zero, and the successor constructor is kind of, we think of that as being our own internal representation of the successor function plus one. So in the second bullet point here, if we had a value like successor of successor of successor of zero, um, then we could think about that as being our own internal representation of the natural number one plus one plus one plus zero, which is three. And you might think, well, why do I want to actually have uh, an internal representation like this? Well, maybe I want to write some programs that process natural numbers in this very primitive form where they're built up by starting from zero and then applying successive, successive successor constructors. It's quite hard to say. So let's have a couple of examples then of functions defined over these natural numbers. Um, I should have also mentioned these are called these things here are called piano natural numbers. And piano is spelt P-E-A-N-O. Uh, piano was an Italian mathematician, and he was one of the first guys who kind of thought about uh, natural numbers being modeled recursively, such as this. So these are the piano natural numbers. So what can we do with these things? Well, here is a couple of simple conversion functions. So I've got a function called nat to int and it converts a natural number into a real or a normal integer. And then I've got a function down the bottom called int to nat, 
And that does the opposite. It takes an integer, which we're going to imagine being a positive or a non-negative integer. It's a natural number, and it converts it into our own little internal representation. So how do these two functions work? Well, if we look at the top, nat to int of 0 is simply 0. That's the base case for the, uh, for the definition. Very straightforward conversion. And then the interesting one says, if you want to convert the successor of any number n into an integer, what you do is you convert the number n into an integer by calling nat to int recursively, and then you simply add 1. Okay, so this is a little recursive procedure or, or little recursive function definition for converting our own internal recursive data type of natural numbers, which we can play around with, into just regular integers. And then down the bottom, we have the opposite conversion. We're converting from an integer into a natural number, and we have a base case which says if you convert zero, you just get zero. And if you convert any positive number, all you're going to do is recursively convert its predecessor, n minus 1, and that will give you the, the, the corresponding nat, and then you put a single successor on the front. Okay, so just two simple recursive functions that illustrate how you can consume a natural number, that's the nat to int function, and how you can produce a natural number as well. So just for a bit of fun then, you can think, well, how could I add, if I wished to, two natural numbers. So two natural numbers could be added by converting them into integers, adding them as integers, and then converting them back to natural numbers. And that's what's expressed at the top uh, of the slide here in the blue box. I'm defining an addition function, it takes a nat, another nat, and gives me back a single nat. And I'm just calling the appropriate conversion function. So I take my two parameters, m and n, which are both natural numbers, I'm calling nat to int on both of them. That will give me the corresponding integers. Then I'm just using the integer addition function, the plus, and then I'm calling int to nat to convert them back. So I've managed to define uh, uh, an addition function here just by doing conversion into integers, adding them as integers, and then converting them back. But Maybe this is a bit inefficient. I mean, I do say many, many times in this course, don't worry about efficiency, just write clear, concise, correct code. But actually this, this time around, it's quite fun actually to think, how could I define this addition function recursively without going through all this conversion back and forward to integers? And actually there's a very simple way to do this. So what we have at the bottom of the slide is a recursive definition for how you add together two natural numbers. So the base case is very simple. It says if you add 0, z-e-r-o, onto any natural number, there's nothing to do. You just give back n. And the second case says if you add the successor of any natural number to any other natural number n, all you're going to do is recursively call the add function on m and n, and then stick one successor constructor at the outside. Okay, so a little bit of a strange definition. We'll see in a minute how this actually works in practice with an example. But one thing to note immediately is why does this function always terminate? Okay, and it terminates because whatever natural number you give it, it's recursing on the first parameter. And in the, in the recursive case, it, it decreases the size of the first parameter by one. So the second case says if you're adding successor of m onto any other number n, what you do recursively is call add with m. So it's calling it on one smaller number. So the add function always decreases the value of its first parameter, and eventually that will be zero, and then the base case will apply, and everything will terminate. Okay. So when you're defining recursive functions, you always start to think about, at this point in the course, why do they actually terminate? So let's have a simple example of this function actually running in practice. So here what we're doing is we're adding the successor of successor of zero, which is just two in our little internal language of natural numbers, and we're adding that onto successor of zero, which is one. So this is just two plus one. And then we want to think, how do we actually get the result three out of this by applying our recursive definition? So we go to our definition, whoops, we go to our definition, and in the second case, if we're trying to add the successor of some number on to any other number n, we add m and n, and then we move the successor constructor to the outside. So that's what we can do here. We're adding the successor of successor of zero onto something. So what we can do is we move the successor constructor to the outside, and then we add one on to one. 
So we add successor of zero onto successor of zero. And then think, what do we do now? Well, we've got another addition, and it's, that's the successor as well. So we can apply the recursive case once more, and we get another successor constructor at the outside. Now we're down to the base case, we're adding zero onto something, and that's just something. And finally, we get back the result successor of successor of successor of zero, which is just three. Okay, so it's a bit tedious to kind of work through these kind of things. It's not really much of a spectator sport, but do please make sure that you understand how to define the addition function recursively here and how to run simple examples. And if you understand this example, that's basically you understand recursive data types in Haskell. So just one little tiny note at the bottom here, the recursive definition for add just corresponds to two familiar laws from arithmetic. So in arithmetic, you know that zero plus n is n, which is saying that zero is the left identity or the left unit for addition. And on the right hand side, one plus m in brackets plus n is the same as one plus in brackets m plus n. And that's just uh, an instance of the associativity property for addition. If you add together three numbers, it doesn't matter how you bracket them, you'll still get the same result. So the last thing I want to think about today is how you can use recursion to define tree-like data types in a language such as Haskell. So the example I'm going to show you is to do with simple arithmetic expressions. So the idea is that we're going to consider a simple form of expression which are built up from integers using addition and multiplication. So here is a kind of little graphical example of the kind of expression trees we're going to be thinking about. So this is a gra graphical representation of one plus two times three. So when we have one plus two times three in mathematics, we normally just think of it as being a string of characters, but really there's some structure there. You do the multiplication first, so you do the two times three, and then you do the addition second, so you do one plus, and then kind of with implicit brackets, two times three. So this kind of tree data structure is really what's going on with arithmetic expressions. So we have the three values, one, two, and three, sitting at the leaves of the tree, and then we have the operators, addition and multiplication. These are the internal nodes of the tree. So this is the kind of a simple expression trees that we want to think about. Then we can think, well, how do we actually represent those kind of trees in a language like Haskell so that we can then start constructing them and actually manipulating them using functions. So using recursion, a suitable new type to represent these simple form of arithmetic expressions can be declared by this top blue box. And this is really a one line declaration, but I've had to kind of split it across three lines, otherwise it doesn't fit on the slide. But fundamentally, it's a one line declaration. So we're declaring a new data type called expr, and it's got three constructors. So we have the val constructor, which takes an integer as a parameter. So that corresponds to the numbers one, two, three, which we have in the tree here. We can use val to build those. And then we have an add constructor, which takes two sub-expressions as parameters. And we have a mol constructor, which also takes two sub-expressions as parameters. And again, the add and the mol constructors are going to correspond to the addition and multiplication operators, which we have in an example like this one. And then we can think, well, how do we actually represent um, simple arithmetic expressions as values in this type? But well, we just build them up recursively using the val constructor and the add and the mol constructor. So here in the blue box at the bottom is how we build the tree one plus two times three as a value in this data type. So at the top level, we have the add constructor because that's the top thing in the picture. Then its first parameter is the value one. So that corresponds to the one sitting in the little blue box to the left of the addition. And then the second parameter of the addition is a multiplication where we have the value two and the value three as parameters. Okay, so this is how you represent the kind of uh, the mathematical expression one plus two times three, or being more precise, this tree here, how you represent it as a value in the expert data type. And a small gotcha here, it's very easy when you're first learning about these things to forget things like the val tag. You might type this in and say, well, why can't I just write add 
of 1, and then in brackets, mol 2 and 3. And that's because the add and mol constructors, these take two expressions as parameters, they don't take integers. So if you want to use integers as parameters to add and mol, you need to convert them into expressions first by using the val tag. So that's why you need the three val tags in the value down the bottom. Otherwise, you get a type error. So what's the point of having these kind of expressions? Well, the point is that now we can write functions to process them and manipulate them. So here's two simple examples. So what I have at the top of the slide is a function called size, and it takes an expression as input, and it's simply going to count the number of values which appear in it. I'm going to define that to be the size of the expression. So if I give it, for example, the expression 1 plus 2 times 3, which we just constructed, just three values in that expression, so this function should give me back the result 3. So how does it work? Well, we're defining it using pattern matching, and we're saying that the size of a value is just 1, so we count 1 for each value. And then the add and the mol cases, these are exactly the same if you look at the definition. To calculate the size of an addition or a multiplication, you calculate the size of the first parameter, x, the size of the second parameter, y, that will give you two integers, and in both cases you just add them together. Okay, so a nice three-line recursive definition for the size function. So down the bottom of the slide, um, here we have an evaluation function, and this does exactly what you would expect. You give it an expression as input, like 1 plus 2 times 3, and it will simply evaluate it and give you its uh, numerical value. So 1 plus 2 times 3 is 7, hopefully, and this function should give you back the result 7 for that example. So how does it work? Well, again, it's defined recursively by using pattern matching. If you evaluate a value n, you just give back the integer n, you get rid of the tag, you get rid of the constructor val. If you evaluate an addition of two sub-expressions x and y, you evaluate the first one, that will give you an integer, evaluate the second one, that will give you an integer, and then you just add them together. It's extremely simple. And it's similar in the multiply case, you evaluate x, you evaluate y, and then you multiply the two things together. Okay, so it's hard to think how you could actually write these kind of functions and these kind of, this kind of tree data type in any more clear and concise way than this. This is kind of the minimal amount of stuff in any programming language that you could imagine writing to do this kind of, uh, to build expressions like this and to write functions like size and eval. So just a couple of notes to wrap things up. Um, these are constructor functions. So val, add, and mol have these types here. And the last point here is related to one of the exercises for, day, for today. Many functions on expressions can be defined by replacing the constructors by other functions using a suitable fold operator. So when we did the, the lecture on higher order functions, we learned about the idea of folding for lists, which captures a simple pattern of recursion called primitive recursion for processing lists. But actually, Functions like these two, these are defined using the pattern of primitive recursion for expressions. So you can imagine defining a suitable fold function for expressions, and then maybe defining something like eval in a more concise way, as you see down the bottom, by supplying three different functions to replace each of the three constructors. But we'll come back to that in a sec when we think about the exercises. So there's three exercises today. Um, we'll have a go maybe at one or two of these on the iPad in a moment. So the first exercise is to extend what we did with addition of natural numbers to multiplication. So we defined addition of natural numbers recursively. You can actually do the same for multiplication as well. And the trick is you, uh, you treat multiplication as repeated addition. So I'll show you in a moment on the iPad how you can define this one. The second exercise, I'll probably leave this one to yourselves to figure out. Define a suitable folding function for expressions, I've called it fold e, and give a few examples of its use. That's a really nice exercise. And then the last one here um, is to define a type of binary trees. So what I'd like you to do is define a type tree a of binary trees built up from leaf values of type a using a node uh, and together with a node constructor that takes two binary trees as parameters. So binary trees have leaves and they have nodes with two subtrees and this is a type of parameterized trees where the values have 
values or the, the leaves, sorry, have values of type A. We'll see in a moment how to do that on the iPad. So let's have a look at the first exercise, which was to define a recursive multiply function. So we're defining a function called mult, and it's going to take two natural numbers, one at a time, it's a curried function, and it's going to multiply one by the other, and we get back a resulting natural number. And we're going to define it by recursion, and actually we're going to define it by recursion on the first natural number. And there's two things that, that that could be. It could either be zero, or it could be the successor of another number. So that gives us a basic skeleton for our function. We can say what happens if you multiply zero by any natural number m, and we'll figure out what to do. And in the second case, what happens when you multiply the successor of some number n, that's the other possible case, by any old number m, which is a natural number, and what do we get? So we've got our two cases now. The first one's going to be a base case, and the second one's going to be a recursive case. What do we do in each of the cases? Well, in this case here, it's very easy to see what to do. If you multiply any number by zero, you just get zero. Okay, so that's very straightforward just from basic arithmetic. Then in the second case, this is one where you need to think a bit. How do you multiply the successor of some number by any other number m? Okay, and again, arithmetic can help you here. So if I take this expression, I'm trying to work out what the result of multiplying successor of n and m is. If I wrote that in mathematics notation, what this is, is n plus 1. That's the successor of n. And then we're trying to multiply it by m. So when you see something like this in mathematics, you know you can multiply out the brackets. You can distribute the multiply um, over the addition. So just by applying some simple arithmetic, this will be n times m plus 1 times m. So I've just multiplied out the brackets. And then you look at this expression and you think, well, actually, I could simplify this a bit now. 1 times m is just m. So I could simplify that. If I get rid of that, I can just write m here. And what we've figured out now, by using some simple arithmetic, is actually how to define the recursive case for the multiply function. Because this bit on the left-hand side is essentially what we're trying to do. And then what we have on the right-hand side is how to achieve that multiplication. So if I just write n times m plus m in Haskell notation, we're basically done at this point. Okay, so let me rub this out and fill in the right-hand side of the definition. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the add function, which we defined today, and then we're going to have the multiply of n and m, and then we're going to have m here. So this is just n times m plus m, but written in Haskell notation. And this turns out to be the right, the right way, or one right way, to define multiply recursively. So this is one of these examples where you might like to try out a little example yourself. I mean, maybe type it into GHC and try multiplying 2 by 3 and see that you actually do get the result 6. And what's going on here is you're defining multiplication essentially by repeated addition. Okay, so a nice example to kind of get more familiar with how to define recursive functions on natural numbers. So we'll have a go at the third exercise as well. I'll leave exercise two to yourselves to have a go at. So exercise three was to define a type of binary trees which have data in the leaves. And in a language like Haskell, which has nice support for recursive data types, this is very easy to do. So all I'm going to do is define or declare a new data type, and I'm going to call it tree, and it's got a parameter. The parameter type is going to be the data which lives in the leaves. And then I have a leaf constructor, and that's going to take a value of type A. Or I have a node, and then we're going to have two subtrees, and these are just of the same type. You have a left subtree of type tree A, and you have a right subtree of type tree A as well. And that's it. That's essentially just a one-line declaration for a binary tree data type. So what's being declared here? We're declaring a new type tree, which has a parameter type A. 
We have a leaf constructor, which takes a single value of type A. So these are binary trees where the data is in the leaves. And then we have a node constructor, which takes two subtrees as parameters. So again, in a language like Haskell, which has nice support for recursive data types, it's very easy to define tree-like data types and functions over them as well. So that's it for today. I will see you again next time.